to our special edition online talk, which is focusing on the question of how to break the bias. We are hosting this interactive session to celebrate and commemorate International Women's Day. Well, now the official date was yesterday, March 8th. We are focusing the entire week now at Chilima Macolabs on the theme, Breaking the Bias. And I'm delighted to see new faces tonight and I hope to hear um, about your thoughts on how to ensure equity in the realm of health-related algorithms. But before we really are getting into the subject, I would like you to be aware that our session will last for 75 minutes and we aim for having as much interaction as possible with you. So rather than having an interrogation of our invited speakers, we encourage you to share your comments and questions in the chat box um, while our speakers are presenting. And we also will have the time for you where you can um, get the mic and, and share your thoughts. So our goal is to identify at the end of this or during this session with you some key takeaways of how we can improve governance and management of AI technologies in health. My name is Marianne Scherling, and I have the pleasure to be the head of stakeholder engagement at the Chile Macro Labs, and I'm also a global health sociologist. My role today, tonight, um, is to lead you through the evening um, or, or afternoon and provide you with some context. My co-moderator, Tala Dulajahi, um, who is a member of our advisory board at Chem Labs, um, she uh, is uh, yeah, um, a great co-moderator and she is as well a source of inspiration and um, always a driving force for topics like tonight. So um, thank you, Tala, for having pulled um, the panel um, together. So um, our special guest tonight are Deborah Gorman, President and CEO of the Greenlining Institute and um, Dr. Ayumide Obuyemi, a health informatics specialist based in Chicago. A few words, uh, I'm really pleased that both of you, um, or the three of you are um, with us tonight. So I would like to share a few words about us um, for those who don't know us yet. The Chile Macro Labs, we, uh, we are a Geneva-based intellectual catalyst that works to support the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And our mission is to shape international collaboration, build capacity, and also accelerate our impact efforts. And this is why we combine um, the thinking and doing, making sustainability actionable. We look, for instance, how new technologies um, can support a sustainable future, such as AI. And um, it is in this context that we host webinars, conferences, trainings, and develop solutions papers um, to inform policy makers. Um, one solutions maker that we just um, launched um, recently, uh, I think it's now two weeks ago, is a paper on AI and the future of work. We also run an initiative called Geneva Impacts, which is a new venture builder. It, um, it's a new approach to coin the world of impact creating investment. And um, in our current innovation cycle, we develop projects on data ownership. So if you're interested to contribute, for instance, to the development of uh, a data marketplace or gamifying data ownership, um, please have a look at um, our website. We have shared the link um, here and we will also do it shortly in the chat where you find some more information. Um, all right, so I hope that you all had a chance to read the opinion piece by Tala. Um, which we circulated before our event today. And Tala asked really a tough question, which is, is AI fair? Now, when AI makes headlines, it seems like that all too often it's because of problems with bias and problems with fairness. And some of the issues are often discussed how to do with facial uh, recognition, policing and healthcare. And yes, we've seen, um, missteps where machine learning is contributing to creating society where some groups of individuals um, are disadvantaged. So what is the case for AI in health? And I believe it starts with a clear understanding, um, with a clear understanding 
understanding of bias in AI, which can exist in many um, shapes and many forms. So in order to explore uh, possible answers, we have organized that discussion tonight. And um, I will show now the agenda. Wonderful. So we will first hear a short keynote from Deborah from the Green Lining Institute, who will share her thoughts of how to help advocates and policymakers develop a baseline understanding of algorithmic bias. And Deborah will also share how the Green Lining Institute examines bias algorithms in healthcare at the workplace, within governments, and in the housing market, um, but as well in finance and education. Um, we will then have the pleasure to listen to Ayomida, who is not only a clinician, but also a health informatics specialist. He will underscore the links between inclusive and trusted digital technology in health, and will make a case around the possibilities for inclusivity and improving trustworthiness in AI and digital tech in healthcare. So during both keynotes, you can already post your questions in the chat box um, or simply comment on the debate. And Tala will co-facilitate um, our discussion. All right, so Deborah, um, lovely to have you with us today. A few words about your background. Uh, for those who don't know you yet, Deborah Gorman is the president and CEO of the Green Lining Institute. She is the former CEO of San Francisco Conservation Corps, and she has over 25 uh, years of experience um, of leadership in nonprofit and private research universities and over 10 years of private sector business development expertise, um, having worked in investment banking, international infrastructure development and engineering. And Deborah earned an MBA and also an engineering degree from Stanford University. Um, she identifies herself as a biracial woman from an interracial military service family. And she is a tireless advocate for ethical and responsible management of mission-driven organizations. Thank you for being with us. Now, Deborah, bias is inherently present in the world around us. And encoded into our society. Now I'm speaking as a sociologist here. It seems that we cannot really directly solve the bias um, in the world. But what we can do is to take measure um, to weed out bias from our data, our models and our human review process. So you present an organization that has begun as an informal um, multi-ethnic coalition of civil rights groups in the 1980s, well, quite a while ago, and formally um, your organization cooperated as an organization in 1993, so that's almost 30 years ago. Today, your institute um, has emerged um, as a leading advocate for racial equity in, very, in a variety of fields, from banking to tech to um, fighting against climate change. So we would like to know from you, what is your take on discrimination in technology and algorithm bias? And then maybe more importantly, how could short and medium or even long-term solutions look like? And uh, I will now give you over the mic. Well, thank you, Marianne, and thank you uh, to Geneva Macro Labs. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. So I have a presentation and I have 10 minutes. So I'm gonna set my timer. We're gonna fly through um, a framing so that maybe uh, it'll help you all with the conversation and um, really want to get to a part where we can just have open dialogue about some perhaps um, creative ways and how we can innovate this space. So let me share and start right away. Okay, so um, my presentation here uh, is about the bias in technology and actually the discrimination that we find here at Green Lining. Just to give you some background, um, like Maran said, we are, uh, we've been 30 years now doing the work and it's crazy that it's still, uh, I think it's needed more now than ever where we envision a nation. So right now we are in the United States um, working on so much of the discrimination bias that's happening here, um, but we envision a nation where communities of colors can thrive and race is never a barrier for economic opportunity. And, um, so in the US, I think it's important to show that for uh, our Federal Reserve, which is sort of our regulatory, our federal regulatory body tracks the uh, racial, racial wealth gap. So this has been tracked um, since, uh, gosh, around 
uh, the, before the civil rights movement in the 60s. But so they're able to say for every dollar that a white family has, what is the measures for other families of color? So you can see for every dollar of wealth a white family has, a black family has eight cents. So there is this is defined as the racial wealth gap in the United States. Redlining then for um, the, the term that, you know, really this happened in the 1930s, but we're finding that it's very evident now. But redlining is the illegal practices of denying uh, services and residential opportunity to communities of color. So literally, oops, so, oops, yeah. so here you can see there's the legacy of redlining um, has carried forward into how data is used today. And so here are different cities within the United States and I'm not sure if you can see it all, but here's Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, Dallas, New York City, Washington, DC. And if you look at the um, access to data um, and who gets that access, it actually maps very closely to the redlining residential um, opportunity. So um, the decisions of who gets access to technology itself, just the, the fiber optics or the Wi-Fi um, that is in communities, and in fact has um, carried over and has an algorithmic bias. And so even within the services and the data set, uh, we, we can see. This example here that I'm showing you is um, Amazon Prime. So in, if you all use Amazon, uh, they use an algorithm that says who gets the, the 24 hour service, who gets prime service and who doesn't. And their maps are based on wealth, um, in, so income, uh, buying habits, characteristics that have redlined already, right? So, um, so they, they in fact do not provide Prime, um, Amazon Prime services to low income communities. So they're, and that's based on an algorithm that they use. Uh, here's internet access. Um, so if you took the, the map on your right is a 1930s map of Oakland, where I'm from, Oakland, California, Oakland, Berkeley. Uh, so those of you went to UC, um, UC Berkeley, I'm looking at you, <laughs> Tala. Um, there's, this is a map from the um, 1930s. Uh, through the 50s, where you see the redlined areas, hence the term, are the neighborhoods that were, were excluded or, from mortgage loans, insurance, um, so because they wanted to concentrate people of color living together because white families did not want to integrate with um, uh, communities of color. So in the, in the yellow tended to be Latinx, uh, Asian. So the map on the the right is a historic red line map. And then if you take the investments, the internet infrastructure investments, and you map that on the left, look how similar they are, right? That, they, that there's no way that somebody had contrived where to make investments, except for the way that we treat folks who are from um, uh, segregated low-income communities. So then, brought, and then if you go from the, now the infrastructure to the adoption, you see that white, white families and communities adopt um, broadband at an 80 percent, um, black um, communities at 71 percent, Hispanic at 65. And, the, and what's key to broadband adoption is academic and social success, and that the, there's a significant correlation between race and, and income gaps too. Um, broadband adoption and the use of technology. Here's a, another way of looking at that uh, incorporation of, of using technology uh, based on opportunities uh, of race and gender um, in particular. So if you look at now data skills, how is that divided by uh, communities? How are, if you have, even if you had broadband and you had access, uh, the measure of the data skill also has a clear racial divide, right? You can see here the adoption um, from the 2002 to 2016, uh, the adoption rate of women, at least that increased to, to from 32% to 40. And then if you go over here to, you can see communities of color, the adoption rate based on race, even across the, that 14 year period, it's still not over 50% um, um, for, white, black, and, and Latino, but you can see that there's a segregation uh, there as, as well. So then, um, and so to, to sort of round out as well, so what does it mean if you don't have broadband 
and you don't have skill uh, skills, then what kind of uh, uh, job and economic opportunity can you create for yourself? And so that also becomes a critical factor. If you don't have the broadband, then you can't develop um, the, the now, the digital skills you need. So those, this, this um, pie chart shows you that those who are um, less, who need less tech skills, so personal aides, construction workers, in, in um, during the pandemic, what we were calling essential workers, frontline workers, right? Low tech skills. Um, and you can see their earning ability and that's and the, the ability to earn more money is based on the higher your tech skills. So if your broadband is limited and your access, and we know that jobs, 84% of jobs seekers are done on the internet, uh, employment, um, doing a job search or re-employment is 25% faster if you're online, um, and then 80% higher paying job uh, if you have uh, digital skills. So then um, even we move to looking at the affordability, right? What creates this di digital divide? What, what are the self-reported reasons? And this comes from um, CETF, which is a uh, foundation um, that's been doing this work for over 50 years. And one of the top reasons listed is it's too expensive, which makes sense. I don't have skills, so I have lower income. I don't have tech skills, digital skills, so I have a lower income. And if I have lower income, I can't afford. And so it's this vicious cycle of how um, folks can actually overcome their, their digital divide. So too expensive, no technology, no hardware, no computer at home. Um, they, they also say, okay, but I can connect um, at school, at the library. Um, so they, they list that as a reason of, um, of self-reporting, not having connectivity at home, um, not comfortable. So I thought this is interesting that 24% are not even comfortable using technology. And then lastly, 21%, I don't even have um, technology or internet to my home. So some of the solutions that we have been working on, uh, this is just on broadband and, um, and digital uh, reasons for the digital dis divide um, is some laws and, and policy that we have passed and we are working on here in California. Uh, we I have a favorite professor, Manuel Pastor at the University of, San, uh, uh, University of Southern California and his favorite saying is, if you want to see the United States on fast forward, look at California. So we are very progressive in terms of the adoption of um, even climate change. We've been doing cap and trade for a long time. Um, we've been now doing vehicle electrification. We, we have been now working on privacy laws, which hopefully we can get into, um, and, and um, ways to create affordability now. So we helped pass this infrastructure bill, um, which had components of affordability, outreach, deployment, competition, and data. Uh, we can go, I'm gonna, there's a lot, this is a very dense slide, but we can come back to it later. So now I wanna shift a little bit that the, now once you even have broadband, I have the equipment, I have an ability to get skilled digital jobs or jobs that have a higher, you know, I'm upskilling my digital abilities. I wanna shift to now, how does all that data collection get automated in a, in a system that perpetuates this redlining? Like in ways that are negatively impacting the health and wealth of communities of color. So uh, there, we published a report, algorithmic bias. We, we explain it as the research. So um, you can get access to that uh, through the Geneva Macro Labs folks. But the algorithm, I think I'm sort of preaching to the choir, but as we defined it, it's a way of uh, a tool of making instructions of solving a problem or performing a task, right? And that that is automated. And then that the, we call the bias then, and I've only got a minute and a half. The bias is um, the, um, the outcome and uh, that occurs once that automated decision happens that is unfair and unjustifiably um, that privileges a certain group. So even when we identify it, we go back to the source and we say, well, if you can justify why you have this, so it's unjustified. So that's what we call bias. Um, here, this is literally algorithms are the gatekeepers to probably every component of what you're doing right now. Bank loans, pricing of goods and services. I just showed you how um, Amazon Prime, uh, you know, segregates based on income, your insurance, your housing, education, the um, hiring for sure. We, I'm sure you've seen some um, 
some articles where uh, websites are using keywords that are male dominant or biased towards um, uh, the way that you live your life and words that you use in your resume. So hiring, criminal justice, access to public benefits um, and access to healthcare. And okay, so let me give you some quick examples here as I head into my last minute. Um, there, there is bias in the mortgage approval um, that there was a markup is a, is a publication that demonstrated that nationally uh, communities of color were 40 to 80% more likely to be denied a loan who had the same credit profile. This is another um, view um, of the, that illustrates uh, the denial rate. So if you look here based on your credit score, so if I have the same credit, credit score 640, 20% uh, of whites were denied, um, we're close to, you know, 26% and then uh, the yellow, which is hard to see here, Latino populations, but just in looking at them, black and white, you can see that they were denied even similarly situated um, access. Oops, one more, let me, oops, let me go back here. Uh, oh yeah, and then Facebook um, and advertising. So there's targeted advertising on the pages that that you visit or the, the um, sites that you landed on and advertisers said, I don't want people who have this profile to be able to get a home loan from my bank or my financial institution. And so Facebook allowed that algorithm to let people target certain um, populations because they didn't want a loan to people of color. And so their, their inherent bias then showed up in their algorithms. The data collection also enables a pre precise and predatory algorithmic targeting. So the language that this population is using to target people, literally, they have names like, uh, here's one, burdened by debt. You're a single person burdened by debt. You have humble beginnings. You are extra needy. So you can imagine folks are writing these algorithms that define populations and they target them for predatory lending or a certain sort of um, uh, services or products um, based on this huge data and disaggregated. And it's so sensitive um, that it even can monitor how long you hover over a link or how long you are resting on a page when let's say you're reading about buying shoes. So it's really, they're able to really target um, populations. Um, and then Amazon, also had used AI in recruiting and then it was shown that, and they were sued that they had a bias against women because when they first started hiring and they were using 10 years of data, when they first started hiring, they were hiring men. And so they, so then they poured that data into an algorithm that said hire men, right? So, so it perpetuated the kind of culture that they were building. Uh, then there was racial bias into the medical algorithms that, fav that uh, favors white patients over sicker patients. So the, the algorithm in this case on the, on the health outcome was that um, they assumed that people who spent more money uh, on certain um, uh, medical services and, and hospital bills had more sickness. But in fact, uh, if you're from low income or poorer communities, you know that you just can't afford health care. So the algorithm said, oh, they spend more money on it. So they must have more sickness. So we need to invest and prioritize them over those who have less money. Just the algorithm was based on a flawed sense of assumptions. Um, and then the, the, this is a huge one, which is public dollars where um, Michigan, so this is closer uh, to where, where our guests will be speaking a bit, but um, they had a public agency that um, looked at um, uh, people who, applied for public assistance. And if the, uh, the algorithm falsely accused more than 20,000 people of, of not needing public assistance, and some people went bankrupt, some people lost services, credit was damaged, and then they found that it was because the algorithm was flawed, that the assumptions in the algorithm, and so now they're being sued and they have to recover from that. And then um, here's one on insurance. Um, that they literally had a, a list that was called the suckers list that they could increase their insurance. So they'd have the algorithm run to increase people's insurance and squeeze um, out folks who are like, you know, so this is the other end. Oh, these wealthy people won't know if we increase their insurance by a thousand dollars because they're suckers. Anyway, so let me get to the solutions real quick, short-term and long-term. We have been working on inventory of high impact 
um, of um, data um, through the government. We help do risk assessments. We're testing disparate impact, the legal term of disparate treatment and disparate impact, and we're creating capacity. Long term, we think if we can get to a system that creates audits, that provides guidelines, um, that updates the civil rights protections and privacies, and then basically algorithmic greenlining. We have a tool in California, again, the country on fast forward called Cal Enviro Screen. And this may be more helpful. So what it does is it takes 21 indicators. So we take the climate, the, the exposure, right? The air quality that you live in, uh, uh, LED or lead paint, from your home, any pesticides. We take the environmental, we take sensitive population indicators, um, pre-existing conditions, um, you know, asthma or cardio disease, cardiac, cardio disease, and we do the socioeconomic education, housing. And they put that into an algorithm that then says, when we allocate resources in the state of California, the first 35% must go to these high impacted communities. And where this seems sound familiar is that the Biden administration has launched Justice 40, the J40, which is 40% of all public goods have to go to the harmed community. So we had been doing uh, green line, we had been doing enviro screen and green lining for many years now. I am so sorry. So thank you. I'm two minutes, three minutes over. I'm sorry, but um, had a lot to download, a lot to talk about, but I just wanted to frame it for you from sort of uh, all the big buckets and how we uh, look at this, this space. Thank you. Thank you, Jera. That was really rich. And I'm looking forward to our discussion um, part uh, after Ayumida has presented um, um, his, his thoughts. Um, it seems to me that what you described are really like the different layers of, of bias, right? You were referring to historical um, bias, to representation, bias, to bias in measurement, um, which seems to uh, be important to address when we are developing the solutions. But before we are talking about solutions and kind of center around what uh, we can do as a global community, I would like to um, now um, move to Ayomida and thank you, Deborah, for, for, for your insight. Um, Ayomida, um, we are really delighted to have you over as well today. Welcome to the stage. Um, and uh, first of all, I would like to properly introduce you. So Ayomide Oboyemi's background is in medicine, public health and digital um, health. Um, and I uh, just realized I haven't uh, shared the screen. Hold on a second. <clears throat> Can you see the screen? Wonderful. And um, Ayomide, he um, has had experience working as a clinic clinician and public health physician in Nigeria. And he also has built different digital health products um, for Nigeria, but also for other African countries. So um, he's an entrepreneur and he has led, I just found that out today, Ayomida, that you have led um, a team that built the first COVID triage tool in Africa. Um, that's quite an achievement. You're also a contributor to a Springer textbook on artificial intelligence in medicine. And currently, to complement already your, your very rich and background, um, you are pursuing a PhD in the realm of health informatics at the University of Illinois in Chicago, with a focus on AI and machine learning applications in healthcare. So I think that can, can be, that, that fits well um, what Deborah has just explained, um, and will, um, as far as I understood, we'll go deeper now into um, some mechanisms of how to break the, the biases. Now, Ayumide, you are one of the authors of an article that I will share in a minute uh, in the chat for on um, um, AI for healthcare in Africa, where you made some really uh, interesting observations. Um, it's an, uh, um, an article that got published by Frontier in Digital Health. And what you are doing, um, you are combining the topics of digital technology in health and development. And in this context, I would love to know from you how you are approaching the question of breaking the bias. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I would just like to share my screen. So can you see my screen, please? Yes, we can. All right, thank you very much. Um, so uh, 
it, it, what uh, Deborah talked about really lays um, a lot of foundation for what I'm going to talk about. She has highlighted a series of challenges that exist in the present space of AI. You know, the, the promise of AI is that it's, you know, when it first started, the promise was that it would solve a lot of problems. You know, people were saying AI will put doctors out of work, it will cut jobs across a lot of sectors and stuff. But as we've realized, the while we that promise is happening in some cases, we, we need to step back a little bit because um, while AI is bringing a lot of um, benefits, it's also causing a lot of harm. As we've seen from what um, Deborah has talked about, how AI is being used to marginalize uh, minority groups and you know, create a couple of problems. So, but by, by means of an introduction, you know, the promise of digital technology in healthcare and development you know, goes around you know, improving precision medicine. A very good example was, um, was, last, was last year or two years ago, a child came into an emergency center and they were not sure of what the problem of that child was. So precision medicine made them do um, a genomic sequencing and there wasn't a genomic sequencing, they understood what was wrong with the child. And based on that genomic sequencing, they, they sort of picked the best drug to target what was wrong with that child at that specific moment. The next day, that child was back home. In the past, before we had you know, the use of AI and you know, genomic sequencing to sort of understand those kind of stuff better, would have taken days or maybe the child might have died. So AI is really changing the way we deliver healthcare. It's making us to you know, to pass to to drill um, healthcare down from the population to the single individual. So these days, we can know what would work best for each and everybody in this room based on the genomic sequence and based on what we can do with AI algorithms. The other thing is around prediction, um, improved and easy accessibility of diagnosis. For example, uh, a couple of people are developing products these days that you really do not. You can use historical data. You can use um, stuff from the data from the EHR to predict. Or to make diagnosis, you know, more, even much faster than um, we would have been able to do in the past. For example, one of the projects I'm working on right now is trying to use AI to look at patient historical data and be able to predict the, the uh, onset of diabetes prior to when it to be detected by regular testing. Now, there are a couple of people doing that already, but we try those applications are going across different aspects of healthcare. Sort of, can we predict diseases before they occur? If we can do that, then we can manage them and reduce. Um, the burden of those diseases. The other thing comes around the aspect of patient empowerment. AI has made it possible for patients to understand their care better. So for example, you, there, are, there are platforms where you register on and it can tell you what you're doing, how you're doing compared to other patients and what you need to do that other patients have done that might be helpful to you. So more or less like patients are being empowered by um, AI. Early warning system for detecting uh, diseases when they break out, disease prevention, Robotics, a lot of um, the Da Vinci um, robotics that has been used to do you know, surgery at a distance, you know, remote surgery these days. And then well, the other thing is about cost reduction. Now, before we go on, it's significant thing to mention, which sort of goes back to what Deborah was talking about when she showed us that map. There's, there's a saying that where you're born has a significant impact on the outcomes you would have later in life. And you know, this, is, this has been shown to so many um, so many research. People born in some specific, so in the US, they use zip codes. People born in some specific zip codes have higher chances of ending up, for example, in jail or dying before a certain age. It's not because of something they are doing, but it's because of some existing systemic situations that are around the areas where they stay that makes it possible or makes them more prone to those certain outcomes. So, and as we know, the social determinants vary across different areas, individual characteristics, socioeconomic environment, and physical environment. We do know that in the past, or even till now, the way pain is perceived for women is different from the way pain is perceived for men. And from what Deborah mentioned about data, you know, feeding into the algorithm. So if pain are estimated at a higher threshold for women than it is for men, if you develop an algorithm based on that data, it means that by the time you're recommending for example, an analgesic for a man at a certain pain level, you're not doing the same for a woman. So that this shows us how significantly these social determinants affect how we treat people, how so a lot of outcomes happen, and then how people sort of end up with the, um, some of the things, diseases or poor outcomes that we see them with. So I want to dwell so much on this 
Um, so what are the extant challenges of inclusiveness and trustworthiness in AI and digital healthcare? Now, we've heard about bias data. The, the problem of bias data is significant in that it, it goes across um, bias data against, um, against women, against minorities. For example, a study that was done in Canada showed that um, the, an algorithm that was built for an healthcare purpose was given bias outcomes against women. Despite the fact that the women and the men were sort of proportionally equal in that data. So it was not even a problem of representation. It was a problem of the fact that there were existing um, information in that data that were biased against women. And so the bias in that data feeds into that bias algorithm and then gives us those bias outcomes. So this sort of feeds into the other so we talked about inadequate data diversity. When it, and some of these things are not necessarily intentional in the sense that people just work with what they have. So if, if we are in this facility, this facility attends to 80% of a certain racial group. If we develop data on based on the data from this facility, then that means there will be inadequate diversity for other groups who would come and seek healthcare. So some of these things are not intentional. In some cases, they are intentional, but some of these are not intentional. For example, this facility where I work as predominantly um, takes care of people from a specific minority, like Black. So we sort of have significant data balance between different racial groups. But some hospitals or some healthcare institutions do not have that. The other part is developmental bias. Developmental bias sort of speaks to the aspect of what happens when you're developing these products. Who funds this development? And that's a problem we sort of relate, I sort of highlighted when I wrote about the artificial intelligence in Africa in the sense that. A lot of AI development that is happening in Africa are coming from abroad, are coming from Europe, are coming from North America. Now, the, the, the priorities of the people in those countries at times do not, um, are not the same, the priorities of these, those African countries. For example, there was this um, AI that was used to detect um, an eye disease. It was developed in, in Europe, and most of the people that developed the data were well-meaning people who wanted to solve the problem of um, access to eye care diagnostics in Africa. But the problem was the data set used to develop it was mainly concussion. People developed the data by mainly concussions, and then people funded the products by mainly concussions. By the time they brought that to Africa, they tested in Uganda, was realized that it was failing because when you look at the um, pigmentation, so the, it has an effect on the way the eyes are too. So that was missing from the, from the data development. If you take it back to the fact that if that was developed in Africa, then they would have made intentional decision to ensure that whatever it is they were developing would fit with the population that would be using that data eventually. So imagine we develop something in Africa and then we export it to, to Europe, for example. That is also going to happen. So being intentional about who develops this, who funds it, the engineers that developed this thing. Um, they were talking about how people are looking at some confounders. And they're using those to predict. The people who understand the data would understand that some sort of in futures in your engineering would and do not necessarily correlate with the outcome. They correlate with another outcome that you need to correct for. But that causes a lot of problems. The other thing is bias in development, I mean deployment rather. And then the last one is opaque systems. So opaque system talks about um, explainable AI and trustworthiness. And that's one of the biggest things in AI right now, developing explainable AI. If I deploy an AI system right now, can the people who are going to apply or who, who, are, who is going to be applied to, can they explain how this AI system works? Because that is very important in understanding why the AI makes decisions it makes. So for example, if an AI says, Mr. A should not be getting this care, and it says, Mr. B, who looks like Mr. A in a lot of ways should not should be getting this care. What is the explanation behind that decision. So for example, when doctors are trained, they're trained in, on the pathophysiology of disease, they're trained on the power chemistry of drugs. We understand how a medication works and we understand why Mr. A should get a medication, Mr. B should not get that medication. The same thing needs to apply to AI. If you're going to use AI to make diagnosis, to make treatments. Um, I'm running out of time, so let me move fast. So what do we need to do for approaches to um, inclusivity and improving trustworthiness? The first thing is data creation and aggregation. Now, this means that there needs to be an intentional approach to ensuring that one, data is diverse. So one of the projects we wanted to do um, in, this in this facility a, few, uh, a while ago was to create, intentionally create 
data that's targeting minorities. So that in, in in the future, when anyone wants to develop a product to use data, they can always use this existing minority data to complement the existing quote unquote bias data they have so that the whatever outcome they have can be spread around. So there needs to be an intentional approach to data creation and aggregation. Then the other thing is about design values. Design values talks about things around inclusive design. If you're designing for some people, you need to, um, ensure that they are integrated in the process or in, in, in every aspect of what you're doing. And then the other thing around data design values talks about open source software, which I will also talk about much later, but I'm sort of integrating other design values because the, the way a product is designed has a significant impact on the effect it has eventually. Almost the same thing for inclusive design practices, but the practices are like people intentionally working on including one, people in um, the end users in the development and people who are like the end users in the team that is developing the product. So for example, a, a future, future engineering needs to include people who understand how this data work, who understand the dynamics of the data. That's a, a part of um, those design practices. And I think that goes into that. It's sort of similar, but a little bit different. It's user-centered design, in which once you're designing, you need to design your product towards who is going to be the end product user. So for example, the eye diagnostics um, AI I talked about the other time, if it was gonna be deployed in Africa, then at the beginning, the people developing that product should have focused on designing specifically for whom the end product and end, end users would be. And the third thing is about improved governance. We're gonna talk around um, explainability, trustworthiness and audit. <clears throat> One of the existing problems with AI products that exist right now is that there's a problem of auditing. So there's an epic um, AI tool that was used across the US, I'll soon round up. And one of the problems of that tool is the fact that the owners intentionally stopped people from auditing the product. Eventually, one um, facility in, in the US did another, and they found out that 67% of the time, that product does not work. But the company that developed it markets it as the best one in town. So allowing for improved governance, which includes audit, explainability, and trustworthiness, would help us to be able to review, evaluate, and audit these existing tools to ensure that they are working the way they're supposed to, and to ensure that they are doing what they're supposed to do. Now, the tough thing is open source, and I'm an advocate of open source because when something is open source, it's more open to audit, the governance is easier, the <clears throat> design practices are much um, tailored towards a wider audience. So I believe that if we sort of follow these processes, we can have more inclusive and trustworthy design. Now, I'm just going to show an ecosystem for um, open source systems. You know, once you build on first principles, we create open source data, and then we build open source tools on those things. It's easier for anybody anywhere in the world to adapt those tools, to improve those tools, to contribute to that data, and to make it useful and more equitable for everyone across the different demographics and areas. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Arimita. That was very rich as well. And I, in particular, I appreciated your um, solutions at the very end where you made a point around um, intentionally design um, AI um, solutions towards the user groups that should benefit from, from um, the solution. And it reminds me of um, um, Jörn, who is our head of um, technology inside, who can't be with us tonight, but he was giving a lecture on Monday on um, AI and blockchain. And he was making the case that um, if we cannot afford having stereotypes um, in an AI solution, then we should not use AI uh, because the costs are, are too high. Thank you so much for, for your insight. Um, we're not stopping here. We actually will continue now for the next um, half an hour to um, talk about um, the different areas um, where we can define solutions. And I'm, I'm now handing over to Tala, who um, I already shared um, was writing an opinion piece on the fairness of AI. And Tala, it was very interesting, um, your final point in, in, in your opinion piece, because you were uh, um, pointing out that um, AI has the potential to improve health outcomes around the world, but the problem is that a lack of regulation, a lack of um, oversight, a lack of willingness to 
um, address the lack of international standards is leading to um, to some pitfalls and shortcomings. And um, you were making a point that in order to have a technology that is not anti that that is actually not anti that is not racist, uh, one that is not uh, inheriting um, bias in terms of um, the ethical uh, base and and um, not ignoring human rights. We need to find new ways of uh, addressing these pitfalls and also, um, um, you know, be uh, in a way brave to face um, what we have done in the past. So, would you um, like to lead us now through um, the discussion where we are uh, picking um, up on some ideas uh, that Deborah and Ayumide were bringing up? Sure, thank you, Mariana, and thank you, uh, Ayomide and Deborah, for your inspiring uh, presentations. I just wanted to say a few words first about International Women's Day and what it means to, for me as a woman, as a woman of color, to commemorate a day uh, in terms of breaking the bias. Um, if you look at the links between climate disasters, climate change, and health, our what we access in the environment, they're very strong. And in some uh, small island developing countries like Vanuatu and others, 60% of the people who farm are women and indigenous women at that. And they are not being given the technology as Deborah had said, the access to the technology or the rights to the AI to, for example, inform them of oncoming disasters and climate risks. Now, when we look at the root causes of COVID-19 and the health implications in terms of whether or not it came from the natural environment, these are serious issues that we're faced with. And basically, I don't have an answer. I'm proposing that there be three takeaways or three areas that we could discuss today. And please just feel free to intervene. I don't want this to be a a kind of lecture series. It's really about in this small working group, whether there can be an advocates type of policy advocates type of network that we can think about creating to look at these three areas of whether or not there can be a GDPR kind of code of conduct in regards to AI and the data science that's being created that Oyomide so clearly outlined. Uh, what is the role of women in particular, women of color and people of color in data science? Are they employed there? Are they working on the facial recognition? Are they adding some cultural literacy in terms of that uh, technology? And then more importantly, how can we work together? If we're looking at the particular case of COVID-19, and this is a specific session on health, I want to look at cultural norms, first and foremost. What are the cultural norms and who gets to participate in the cultural norms? This is cultural theory, this is cultural literacy. So even in communities now in the United States, we have BIPOC rooms. BIPOC is for Black Indigenous People of Color. This is a kind of terminology and I've spoken to my women colleagues about it in Colombia. We don't identify as, a pre as persons of colors, we identify as this. But when you look at different rooms that BIPOC people are being put in, you have to ask, what's the main room? When you're looking at vaccine equity and the people who are promoting the vaccines, Bill Gates, the European Commission, you have to ask, what is the cultural norm by which they are operating? where they don't feel that Africa as a continent, separate countries, separate governments, but being referred to as one entity is not fully prepared to take on the production and distribution of their own vaccines. So this kind of colonial techno um, the dialogue, the, it does, I think, very much seep into who is creating our data and how our data is being identified. I am very scared, having grown up in California, Deborah, to think that there are 12 more or 12 to 15 white guys, young guys in Silicon Valley, defining who I am, 
what I access, how I access it. I find this terrifying. And if we can't come up with an international standard or at least advocate, adv become advocates for the policy to push for that international standard, then we cannot shift mindsets because the status quo is happy where it is. That's why it doesn't reshift. We have got to lobby, we have got to push for some kind of change through what we're doing now. And this is a good step. We have 22 people on board. It's more than enough to start some kind of thinking group, advocates group, working group, where we can all in our own field begin to push that policy. And so I'll just stop there. If I could go to first Deborah to speak to you more specifically about um, the role of women and women of color and particularly in helping to change the way that uh, AI is influencing uh, these communities in, in uh, the United States. I'd like to kind of hear about that first. Yes, um, so you touch on so many important aspects. And I, I think in particular in the United States, there's colonialism and there's capitalism. And the capitalism is such a strong uh, value ethos here as we sit in Silicon Valley and so close to all the technology. Um, and so um, they do what is profitable, right? So if it's profitable, then I'll get venture capital funding. And I think the role for um, women so, so there's an ongoing conversation about, oh, we need to build the pipeline so that women can be data scientists and, and yes, all of that. But you can just look at the outcome, right? So I don't need to understand how the algorithm was written, but I can look and analyze for you it, it, as a woman, as a woman of color, as a community, I can look at that outcome and tell you if it has dips, disparate, as, uh, disparate impact and disparate treatment. And then I can go back to the scientists and say, the thing you just ran, which is very, you know, um, the, the problem we're starting to have here, or not even starting, the problem that's been articulated with um, vehicle electrification, where there's so much automation is that there's a lack of identity as to um, who's getting hit and run over in these theoretical radical, um, spaces because it's it all the data is about white men. And so if it sees a person of color walking, it doesn't identify and so it will hit that person. But if I if I if you include um, women or other, especially women, and you know, because we do so much of the child care, so much of the elder care, and we look at how the algorithms, the way we receive that data is going to inform inform the beginning. So not only should we be at the beginning of the process in terms of um, leadership, we should be on those boards, um, we should create um, workspace so that they can be hired, but you can have an immediate impact on looking at the outcome, right? We can immediately say, um, if, you, if my child who has asthma, a child of color has asthma, it, that's not going to work because she also has asthma or also has eczema that may flare up, right? That there's a particular um, perspective. So, so just as a, a way to bring um, women into the conversation, I, I would first advocate for them to um, look at the outcomes, but, and as well um, be in sort of the uh, executive managerial suites. Um, that, that's just tactics, right? Straight tactics. If you speak to the, the values, um, the, the, the cultural values, I think now you're sort of, you really are getting into um, some complex areas where we, we are trying to de delineate between um, being very localized because um, what happens you know, in California is gonna be different than what happened in Lagos. And so those, you should be able to have some control over your local values and sensibilities um, that, that can then be held under a universal goal. So it's kind of this uh, concept of targeted universalism, but I'll stop there. Um, those are just some ways that we are trying to approach it all with a privacy lens, by the way. <laughs> so. Yes, we need that privacy. Um, Oyomide, if I could ask you, because Mariana brought it up rightly so, and in our conversations before, uh, AI bias is not just as Deborah was highlighting um, in terms of the data science that's being created, it's actually at, at many countries creating infodemics 
in terms of misinformation and it's targeted infodemics in lower and middle income countries. In my own country of Iran, there was some rumor through AI that was spread that you could drink something and people were actually doing that and getting very sick and having to go to the hospital. And so in regards to COVID specifically, uh, has AI been helpful or a hindrance in terms of these infodemics? Um, I would say it's, it's a mix because um, like, 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 um, like Debra said the other time, these countries are built for um, profit. So for example, we take a look at, at Facebook, for example, the Facebook algorithm amplifies um, posts based on the level of interaction it has. The amplify posts based on how um, people sort of react. So by their reaction buttons, the likes, the comments, the shares and everything. And then it also amplifies posts based on some of the things you've read in the past, some of the, um, um, the kind of things you've shared. So the problem is, is that it, it doesn't sort of, at, at its basal element, it doesn't sort of screen out if false information or not. If everybody in my circle, they are sharing false information, I'm likely to get that false information. I need to get that false information suggested to me. Now, problem is that we can say it, the intention of the AI is not to amplify false information, but it's just something that happens because of the way the system is designed. So that is where the concept of being intentional comes in, in the sense that what, what does the AI amplify? What, is, there, is there something we can develop that can identify misinformation and then label it? And then once the existing algorithm wants to amplify it, it does not amplify that existing misinformation. Now, we understand the concept of free speech, which is a very, very nebulous term. It's been used in different ways in, in the society. Yeah, like people can say what they like. Yes, I can go and post on Facebook and say that um, COVID was activated by 5G. We, we all saw that it happened at the beginning of, of, of the stuff. And I saw a lot of posts like that. A lot of people shared them to me. I saw them on Facebook. But it was because of the people I was interacting with, discussions I had, those posts came up. But if the people behind these companies intentionally sort of tag these um, posts as being um, a sort of misinformation, then they can target their AI to not amplify them. Now, truth be told, it's not an easy process because when you look at these companies, one of the commonest things we like to do is to automate. So I create an AI that automatically automates amplification and then I can go to sleep. Even if I don't check the system in 30 days, it's working the way it, it is. But if we understand that trying to do all these things requires special effort by someone doing the labeling. So in a way, AI has been helpful, but it has also been an hindrance because people get, people get um, a reinforcement of what they read. So for, I'll give a very good example. I saw something on Facebook. I saw, a, I saw a video that I didn't agree with on Facebook. But I just wanted to know what that person said. A few days later, I was getting the same kind of video that was related to that wrong information. Now I could discern because I knew it was the wrong information. I just watched it so that because so that I could re respond to someone who shared it to me. But imagine someone who doesn't know better. That person will keep getting that same reinforcement of that information. So that, that, that's the harmful part. And a lot of people right now, it, it's we can't even imagine the scope of it. A lot of people do have very, very um, wrong perception and mindset about COVID and about the vaccine. So for example, um, we did a study recently and it showed that people are interested in taking COVID pills, but they're not interested in taking COVID vaccine. So it shows that the problem is not that some of these people do not believe in COVID. They believe in COVID, but they have a problem with the vaccine, but they are open to taking the pill. These same people that are not taking this vaccine would take other vaccines. They would take the flu vaccines, they would take the MPI and other schedules. So it shows that there's, a, there's an amplified problem that is going around with that COVID vaccine that they have a problem with. So what would help? The people who run these platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Google, and you know, they need, would need to sort of step up in, in for the public good to ensure that they sort of work on, you know, increase their staff and capacity in labeling this information as misinformation so that whatever AI they've developed would not keep amplifying that wrong information or will put a proviso or a disclaimer around the information, which is what some of them are doing. But as we realized, it's not enough because if I want to make money, 
at times people sort of um, overlook uh, good values, you know, in, in ensuring that they achieve their profitability. You know, we've had a case of Facebook intentionally amplifying um, posts that should not be amplified because someone paid for it or because it's going to increase the views and the people coming to their platform. So, and they sell those views. So the more views they have, the better it is for them. It doesn't matter how they get the views. To them, the end justifies the means. So I think that's a problem. So we need to balance it. It's been good, but there's been a lot of bad. I know that we have just, thank you so much, uh, Oyemide. Um, I know we just have about 10, 15 minutes left and I wanted to turn it back to Mariana, see if we have questions. I see our president is here. Ekahard, if you have uh, any questions, um, turn it over to our participants. Again, please feel free to, to chime in if you have anything to ask of these two speakers. Oh, we already have a question here. Uh, I see Mariana, should I read it or? Um, yeah, um, it's from Dijan and um, it's about removing bias. I would suggest them, Dijan, that you address your question directly and feel free to comment as well. Uh, yes, I just wanted to ask uh, uh, after uh, all uh, of this um, talk, like, like uh, uh, removing bias uh, might be a difficult task at the moment, and I wanted to know if uh, it is the case and uh, uh, why exactly, what, what are the factors that uh, uh, make it difficult, uh, or uh, is it just possible to remove bias uh, uh, by uh, thinking beforehand uh, what the are the possible sources that might cause bias and uh, uh, fix uh, um, any issue early on? Thank you, Dijan, for the question. It was not so easy to understand due to the sound, but um, if I could, could recap, you were asking um, about the possibilities to remove biases and um, to what extent um, this is possible. Um, I would suggest, Ayomida, that you um, comment on this question, um, but the idea as well is to all the other participants that you can um, share your view and your perspective uh, on that, so please uh, don't be shy, but I let you first, um, Ayomida, uh, respond. Um, yes, so that, that's a very good question, and I will just easily go back to what uh... Debra, Debra presented in the sense that uh, we, it, it's um, it's very difficult to remove bias because, for for example, the existing tools or the existing data is already biased, and it's really difficult for you to correct the bias in historical data. It's happened. You can't really go back and you know sort of change what happened in the past. You you can correct. You can correct what you have presently, but the past has happened, and those those things are coming from the past tend to feed into the present. What you can do is that when you're making the development, you need to acknowledge the bias in that data and try to control or manage for it when you're doing development. So that that is the way you can manage the past. In the present, what you can do is to ensure that um, when data is being collected presently, you try to do it as equitably as possible. Now we understand that there are things that we can manage. For example, if you're going to collect data through tele two telephones or through mobile phones, for example, in a place like Nigeria, you're going to have a, 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 a more males represented in that data because if you check the data, phone ownership in Nigeria is tweeted more towards the men. So that, that there's going to be a bias in the people you sort of interact with. But the, the possibility is for us to minimize that bias as much as possible. You know, there's no... As someone likes to say, there's no perfect system in, 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 there's no perfect human system. Even nature is not perfect at times. So there's no perfect human system. But the idea is, can we minimize this bias to an extent in which you can say to a certain level of degree that this is fair? So it's more or less like, how, 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 much, of, how much fairness can we get? So one, in the, 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 the data collection, the, the future engineering, like, like it was mentioned, people choose specific futures and think those features predict an outcome, whereby there's something else in those features that is causing those outcomes to happen. So 
data, development, design, and de deployment. So those are like the, the phases. Once you try to manage bias intentionally, that's, a, that's another part, you need to manage it intentionally. Because I can sit down and design something in my room, and then I take it and, then, and I see people pointing out, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, because I don't know. But if I'm intentional about it, I will talk to people who know more or who have more insight to that data to correct that data. I think Debra has, has more to say around that. Uh, uh, one, I love the question, Dejan, that, that the idea of just understanding your own bias, but I would say if you work towards eliminating harm, that you will be working on your bias. So if the things that I am doing create harm for whoever, then I have discovered my own bias. And if, so if I, in the fairness lane and then the, the do no harm, have no negative impact, um, th those can guide you towards your bias and then working towards, you know, not fully eliminating bias because some bias is good, right? In terms of if, if I am uh, situated a certain way, I want you to be able to identify my separate distinctions to be able to create solutions for me. So I think it's it's the idea that um, I want to identify bias so that I can do um, those things that are well and, and healthy and, and good for my community. And uh, that, that usually centers on whatever the AI is doing, if it's creating harm, then it's probably built on bias. Thank you, Deborah. I, um... Feel that this is also um, talking to the question that um, Dami um, Aina um, had. Um, Dami, would you like to address a question um, yourself? Otherwise, I'm more than happy to, to read it. What is the current process of collecting data that would help reduce future biases? And that kind of touches a little bit on what we already talked about. Um, Tala, what is what is your take uh, on that in terms of collecting data? You have any any thoughts on that? Well, you know, I, I again would turn to Eckhart. I want to put you on the spot, but it's, you know, it's about labor. Who is employed that is creating the data? And if it's not a person that is of color and it's mostly people working not intentionally, like, you know, Ayamide say deliberately, but intention and impact are causal here and they're very direct. So I'm trying to create a platform so that people can access this data health set in this in this country, but my mindset is so much based on a colonial cultural norm and I don't have anybody else in the room, a data scientist who is of a different religion, background, culture, color. So it's really about the employment issue, making sure that we have a diverse data scientists employed within these structures. Eckhart, do you have anything to add? Yeah, thanks. Thanks for putting me on the spot. Now, <laughs> no, great, great discussion so far. I, I just, I, I just wanted to actually come back to what Dejan said and and the uh, the interesting discussion around it. You know, how do we understand uh, where bias comes from? Because I think it's an it's an important point uh, that that was raised also in earlier in the discussion about what is the economic interest in solving the bias? And often enough, unfortunately, it is there is no interest because it's not worth it, you know, because you cannot make money out of it. And I mean, uh, Ayumidi, you mentioned uh, yourself, uh, um, why is it that we don't see more uh, um, of these um, uh, of these tools gather, uh, uh, catering towards um, what uh, African countries could benefit from. I mean, not only in health, also in agriculture, for instance. And it's not being done because uh, companies cannot make enough money out of it. And I think that's that's a key issue, like understanding this, the complexity of the economic interest uh, in, in trying to solve the um, the underlying discrimination that uh, uh, that we that we face today, uh? and I mean there is indeed unfortunately not a good pro, uh, 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 solution to it, other than kind of more bro broadly saying that we need to in, uh, empower these communities, these countries, uh, these uh, specific uh, uh, people, in order to actually present in a sense an economic interest for uh, for some of these uh, companies to cater to these. To these people, uh, and again, it's and it. Unfortunately, I mean, seeing my po the point I'm trying to make. Unfortunately, it's not something that you can solve uniquely just by looking into 
data policies, data regulations, etc. I think you need mm -hmm. to have a broader vision on it in order to be able to to solve that problem. But thanks for a great com great conversation tonight. Thank you. But it's very interesting, Eckhart, that you just have mentioned the word empower. I feel like the word empower is 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 a word that um, is used a lot currently in in the discussions around how to address bias, and it seems that sometimes we we stop at the empowerment idea and don't go the step further and ask so how does empowerment look like and i, I feel tell if you you propose the 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 question or the theme of thinking about the role of diverse um, data scientists and, and and women and that kind of spoke to me thinking of well if you would like real empowerment we need to think about how um um we can make sure that um diverse perspectives um, are included at every every level and that is responding to the comment that you Olufemi made in the chat um, you were wondering if representation at all levels can help with minimizing bias um, I would say um, yes um, being a sociologist I would regard our reality as as a social construction and we are all part of this construction so it's a matter of uh, willingness and as well um, openness of of um, those currently um, in, in, in powerful positions to allow um, minorities and also unpopular perspectives to be equally discussed and to provide um, some substantial um, um, uh, reach to show um, the, the pitfalls of current systems. And I, I love the examples that you provided, Ayumida, in, in your presentation that showed that it doesn't make sense to develop um, any solution uh, in, in, in the global north where um, it was already clear from the beginning that the application will be in the global south. So there seems like to be like a, a, a disconnection in, in, in efforts. And I'm wondering what we can do to you know, um, get better aligned. And it feels like that um, um, something like an international um, uh, body that would provide a platform for that could be um, a way forward. But um, that is a question of if there is the willingness of the current uh, system to allow for such a space. I see you nodding, Deborah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely, I mean, we're, we're at time here, so I want to respect everybody's time. But I, I, yeah, I definitely think that the, the, um, the conversation in itself is a movement towards um, something that is, is more equitable. And so I think that we have to amplify these conversations in the smaller spaces that you're in to create sort of a larger movement. Yeah, I think I think what uh, the other thing I would say to that is, um, like, like you mentioned, is number one is it, 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 two things would help from my perspective. I know there are local, a lot of things that would help. But number one is that when we talked about the open source around data creation. So there, there are a couple of these things that exist online, but I'm not sure about open. For example, in the US, a lot of the AI for clinical medicine developed are done based on the MMIC data sets. That's what most people would do um ai development for in the clinical setting in the clinical setting you use so is it possible for us to create this that kind of data set targeted towards specific variables that is global that anybody can sort of apply to now for, for you to use mmic data you need to be credential but once your credential you can get access to it it's free to use just get the credential and access it so is there a way to create that sort of balanced equitable data set that can be open source and anybody can use and then the other thing you mentioned about governance, there are a couple of people that are working around the aspect of governance, trying to see how we can audit, uh, create explainability, and create more trustworthy data set. But there's more effort in that in that, needed in that area. And the other thing is, when it comes to um, the global south, a couple of people like Microsoft, IBM, they're not creating centers in those countries. They have a center in Kenya, they have a center in um, Ghana, where most of the tools that we developed for those areas would be developed. So they're employing African data science. For example, in Nigeria, there's, a, there's, a, there's an organization called DSN. They are training 20,000 data scientists per year. So that, that is huge. So once we have more of that, then we can have more representation coming from those 
um, minor groups. So same thing can be done targeted to women, targeted to blacks in the US, in, in the, in the US and other uh, minorities across Europe and North America. So I think those three things would be very helpful. Thank you, Ayamida. Uh, Leonie, I saw your hand uh, up. Uh, did you want to share something as well? Yeah, I had a question, but then we were going on a macro level and I kind of wanted to hear what everyone was saying about that. So um, I want to respect everyone's time as well. So I don't know if there's more time for a question. Okay, um, maybe uh, we can continue um, the following way. Um, we have asked both um, speakers that after our um, conversation um, tonight or to this morning, <laughs> it's still morning uh, for Deborah. Um, we would like to follow up on one specific question and, and ask them to write a very short think piece uh, on that. So maybe we can, you know, take that um, to, to, um, to inform the think piece and, and share uh, the thoughts with, with uh, in our community um, to, to continue that, this discussion. Um, that is anyway our goal as Studio Macro Labs that we have conversations, um, meaningful conversations, and then continue after our events, if, if that is fine. And one of my um, key takeaways is really um, to create um, data that target minority, minorities um, with the help of open source. Um, it seems to me to be one viable um, path forward. Um, Tala, what do you think? If, given the time um, that we are now five minutes um, already um, longer than we, we planned for, uh, I would like to thank everyone uh, for staying a little bit longer with us. And in particular, I would love um, to express um, um, our gratitude that Deborah and Ayumida, you, you made the effort to um, um, provide your morning uh, to our community. And uh, we will be happy to share the recording uh, to the greater community um, afterwards. So thank you so much for your insight. And also thank you um, to all participants who joined. I would um, invite you that you reach out to us uh, if you have additional thoughts and questions that you would like to um, share with us so that we can um, um, incorporate them in, in, in our thinking process. And um, with that, um, and normally we ask our speakers for a very short final statement. May I ask Ayamida and Deborah, both of you, for your key takeaway that you, uh, yeah, that you uh, um, um, would like to share with our community? Ayamida, would you like to go first? <laughs> Oh, yes, thank you. Um, I, I guess my, my key takeaway was, was the three things I mentioned previously. So I, I think I don't need to, so I don't take it this time. Just about, you know, creating collaborations that can help across those three areas so data creation, um, data governance, and, um, um, and training. Those three things would be mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I would um, just quickly add as well that there there is space for all voices, and I feel like uh, just the richness of this conversation demonstrates there's a that there is a need for it. Um, and then I would I would definitely say uh, the the ability to understand the impact and the treatment of whatever it is that we're doing in this space um, will guide us. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, that's very strong and. Before we are closing um, our event um, today, I would like to completely shift topic. Um, as we all know, we are living right now in quite turbulent times. Um, and I'm referring to the situation in the Ukraine. Um, it was, um, it's definitely something that is um, on our agenda at Chimo Macro Labs. And we uh, would like to inform you that we started an initiative to support friends and family that are currently on the way to Geneva. And um, we started a campaign on Kapalana, which is a partner organization of us um, who um, help us to do a, a crowdfunding um, campaign. I'm just posting the link um, in the chat for everyone you to review. And we would appreciate if you could um, help us in um, support these families that are arriving as I am speaking. And um, um, there will be more information to come. We will um, mostly share over LinkedIn what we um, have in the pipeline. And we would be uh, really uh, grateful if you could join our forces uh, in, in, in that endeavor. 
So um, I would like to thank all of you for your engagement tonight, um, for your contribution, for your reflection. And um, if you would like to engage in our community and co-shape our work as Think and Do Tank, you are cordially invited to join um, and become an official member. Um, please find as well that link in the chat. And with that, I wish you all in the name of the entire team a wonderful rest of the day and hope to welcome you very soon again. And uh, last but not least, thank you and bonne soirée de Genève. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Good night. Much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.